Welcome to Thursday, September 24th, Virtual Book Talk. My name is Wendy, and I am a reference librarian at Grandview Heights Public Library. Typically, I work up in the adult department in, near the computers or in the nonfiction department. Um, so you might recognize me from there. But in a previous life, I was actually a teen librarian. And that's actually the kind of books that I still read mo for the most part. Um, so I was actually really excited when Jen asked me to help out with these book talks. Um, these books are from the basement area. Some are for the younger end of the spectrum and some are for the older end. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of them. There will also be a um, link attached to this post. So if you're interested in one of them, you can click on the link, find the book that you're interested in. And I've tried to include any other um, formats that are available as well. So if maybe you're interested, but you want to listen to it instead, the audiobook copy should be there, ebook, e-audiobook, in some cases even large print if that's what you're into. So um, let me get started. Um, the first book that I have today is called Esperanza Rising. It is by Pam Munoz Ryan. Hold it up here so you can see the cover because actually I really feel that um, a lot of people do judge books by their cover. It's pretty important. <coughs> Excuse me. With this book, um, this is actually a semi-biographical book. Um, the author's grandmother um, is actually the inspiration for the character of Esperanza. Um, Esperanza Ortega was about 13, 12 or 13 years old growing up in Mexico um, on a very large ranch. Her family was very wealthy. Um, and um, they had, I believe that they were growing grapes and producing wine, that sort of thing. Um, at one point, however, her father is murdered and um, suddenly her entire life is in jeopardy. Like everything that she knew, every, um, all the protections that she had are no longer there for her. Um, she and her mother actually end up fleeing to the San Joaquin Valley in California to get away from some uncles that are trying to take over and force Esperanza's mother to marry the uncle. Um, and this, well, this is happening during the depression. So late 1920s, 1930s. Um, and during that time in the San Joaquin Valley, there were tons of labor camps where um, migrant workers would harvest all the crops and the conditions were so different from what Esperanza was used to. She had gone from, you know, being sort of the lady of the house to actually being, she was, she was basically living on the same level that like the people who had been her servants um, were before. So it was like a total, a total restructuring of her entire life. And this book talks about like how she adapted to that, um, how she had grew as a person, um, started to take things not so much for granted. Um, I just actually read this myself for myself a few months ago and I really enjoyed it. Um, it reads really fast. Um, it's, it, it, I do feel that even though it takes place in the, the 20s, 30s, it has a lot of, it, it still provides a glimpse of, to what some people's lives are today. So again, Esperanza Rising by Pam Munoz Ryan. The next book that I have here is actually um, a Newbery Medal winner. It's by Rebecca Stead, and it's called When You Reach Me. Um, in this, the main character's name is Miranda, and she's in sixth grade. And um, her entire life is going through uh, a lot of changes, as often happens in about sixth grade. People who were her friends for a long time are suddenly kind of avoiding her. She doesn't really understand why. Um, she lives in New York City with her mom in a, an apartment, um, goes to a public school. So as I said, a lot of her friends, or her main friend Sal, is suddenly avoiding her and she doesn't know why. Um, so she does make some new friends, but it's, it's really difficult for her. And then some strange things start to happen. Um, she starts getting these notes that talk about things that have been lost and tell her where to find them and give her other clues about like what's going to happen in the near future. And those things do come to pass. Um, 
with this, she starts thinking about the, the possibilities of time travel. Her favorite book is A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengel, who is one of my favorite authors. Um, and so one of the aspects of that is moving through time, moving to different places. Um, and she starts to wonder if maybe these notes are coming from the future or how other ways that it would even be possible that the person who's sending the notes to her could possibly know what they know. Um, I really like this book because it's it covers a lot of genres. It's kind of a family story because it's the interaction of her and her mom. Um, it's dealing with, um, you know, her friends making new friends, dealing with people who are suddenly changing in her life. It's also got the mystery aspect of where these notes are coming from, the pressure that she feels from getting these notes. And then also there's like the sci-fi aspect because is time travel really a, a possibility? So again, Rebecca Stead, when you were, when you reach me. So I mentioned with the last book that um, Miranda, the main character, her favorite book was um, A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle and how Madeline Langle is one of my favorite authors. So I decided to include one of um, my favorite books by Madeline Langle, and that is The Arm of the Starfish. Um, this book is actually really old. It's older than I am. came out in 1965, which kind of makes you think I don't want to read a book that old. But even though there's there's some things that do seem kind of dated in it, it's still a really wonderful mystery story. Um, the main character's name is Adam Eddington, and he's 16 years old, and he just received a very prestigious um, internship with a marine biologist who is living with his family in Portugal. So he's at Kennedy Airport in New York, and he's waiting for his flight, and Suddenly he's approached by this um, really beautiful girl who um, tells her tells him that her father has actually had dealings with Dr. O'Keefe, the um, scientist that Adam is going to work with, and that how he isn't really what the Dr. O'Keefe isn't really who he seems to be, that Adam is going to have to be very careful and um, there's, there's some nefarious dealings going on that... Um, he might, he might get in trouble for. On the plane to um, Portugal, he meets um, a man named Conan Tallis, who is actually traveling with Dr. O'Keefe's oldest daughter, Polly. Um, the plane is diverted because of weather and um, Conan Tallis can no longer take care of Polly. He has to leave the plane. So he asks Adam to take Polly the rest of the way back to Portugal to be with her family since he's going to the same place. In the process of doing so, however, Polly disappears off the plane. So even though Adam totally discounted what the beautiful girl told him at the airport, now he's beginning to think that there really is something going on that he's somehow become wrapped up in and he doesn't know how to decide who is telling him the truth, who is lying to him, um, and who he should believe. So, um, I, again, I really like this book. It's a great mystery. Um, I read it again just last year when I was in Portugal, and it was actually the reason that I wanted to go to Portugal because of some of the descriptions. And, um, again, Madeline Lengel is a wonderful author. I can actually recommend almost anything that she writes. So, again, The Arm of the, Far the, Arm of the Starfish by Madeline Lengel. The next book on the list is also a Newbery winner. Um, it's called Maniac McGee by Jerry Spinelli. I, um, I wasn't really looking forward to reading this one. Um, I wanted to pick something else that was maybe a little bit more sporty. Uh, it's not something I'm really into. I tend to like more mysteries or fantasy science fiction. Um, but I wanted to pick more of like a real story. Um, but when I was reading this, I actually listened to the audiobook. Um, I was really surprised with it. It's so much more than what I thought it was about, which was just a kid who runs. Um, so the thing is, is that Maniac McGee was, he was a kid who runs. Um, his parents were killed in a freak accident when he was really young and he was raised for eight years by his aunt and uncle, but his aunt and uncle hated each other. So, um, they, 
and they didn't really like spending time with Jeffrey, Maniac McGee's real name. He, um, so at a certain point, he just decided he, he couldn't take it anymore and he started running. So he wasn't just running away though. He just kept running and kept running and kept running. Um, the town that he lived in was on, is in Pennsylvania and it's on the Schuylkill River and it's divided into like the east side and the west side. So, um, he runs to what would be considered the wrong side of town and, um, comes into contact with people that he had never met before. Um, and it, it's, it's so interesting because no matter who it is that he meets, he, he actually like manages to form a bond and it shows the, it shows the racial tensions in the town because people say he shouldn't go to that side of town, but he does. And he realizes that so much of it is the same. He finds people in the wrong side of town that care about him. He finds a family that he lives with for a, a short amount of time. So he has a sister and two younger siblings as well and a mom and dad who care for him and make sure that he's fed and clothed and taken care of, which were things that he didn't get when he was living on his side of town from his aunt and uncle. Um, it really shows like the meaning of, of the word family and how it's, it's not necessarily limited to just people that you are related to. Um, he meets, he, he lives homeless for a while. He, there's so many things that he experiences that you just kind of don't get from the cover of the book. It's, it's really a very, it's very touching. It's, um, it's not the kind of book that's like actually going to like make you break down in tears if, if that's something you like for when you read. But I think it actually does speak to like an experience that some people do have. Um, so again, I, I really, I really like this. Um, and I was surprised by it. So, you know, maybe you're thinking that uh, that's not my book. Maybe just give it a chance. That's what I always say with books. Give it a, give it a few pages. Maybe you like it. Maybe you won't. You can always go on to the next book on the list. So again, Jerry Spinelli, Maniac Mickey. My next book is, um, something completely different. We're starting to get into the older teen titles now. Um, this I've, since 1977, I have loved Star Wars. Um, so it's really not a huge surprise that I have a Star Wars book here on my list. This, um, this one is by E.K. Johnston and it's called The Queen's Peril. Um, basically this is the story of Queen Amidala, um, before the Phantom Menace. So when we see her, she's on all the long gowns with the big hairdos and all of that stuff. But how did she get to that spot? We know that she's 14. She was elected queen, which is something that is totally unusual for what we know as far as government goes. Um, so this is, this is a story of how she got elected, how she rules, the people who support her, all her handmaidens who are actually trained to be her security, how they all have different skills and are not just these, the faceless, um, Double, doubles that appear in the movie. Each of them has a specific job, specific skills, and they're all there to protect and provide support for Padme Amidala. So again, I, I enjoy, I've enjoyed Star Trek, or excuse me, Star Wars for decades now. Um, and I did really like this book. E.K. Johnston, the author, is also has also written several other books that are not in the Star Wars series. So maybe you've read one of them and might like to jump into this a little bit as well. So E.K. Johnston, Star Wars, Queen's Peril. The next one on the list um, is one that you might have heard of already. Um, it's gotten a lot of press over the last couple of years. There's actually a movie made of um, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Um, I just read this this summer, um, especially given all of the, um, the protests and unrest that we've had over the last several months and even yesterday. So in this, if you haven't read this, I, I really, I can't recommend it enough. I could barely put it down when I started reading it. Um, the main character's name is Star Carter. She's 16 and she pretty much leads a double life. Um, she and her family live in a poor neighborhood um, because that's where her parents grew up and they want to continue to support the neighborhood to try to make it 
a better place so that it's not overrun by gangs as it is right now. Um, the family store is there and her family history is there and they, the whole family respects that. Um, however, they, her parents also decided to send her and her brothers to a, um, fairly wealthy prep school outside of the area where they live so that she can get a good education, get into a good college and, um, maybe then do more to even turn the, turn her neighborhood around. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the double life. When she's at school, she has to talk a different way. She has to act a different way than the way that she normally does at home. Um, so one evening she goes to a party with her cousin and, um, uh, meets an old friend there, one of her childhood friends, someone that she grew up with, but who didn't end up going to getting, um, to go to the same prep school that she goes to. So she kind of lost contact with him. His name's Khalil. Um, something happens at the party and they have to leave really quickly. And she, as Khalil is driving her home, um, they get pulled over by the police. And, um, even though they are, Khalil and Star are doing nothing wrong, the police officer ends up shooting and killing Khalil and, um, Star is there for the entire thing. She's holding her, one of her best friends as he dies. Um, so as happens in many cases, um, this further divides the city where she lives. She, um, none of, but none of her friends at her school know that she is the person who was in the car with Khalil. Khalil is painted as a gang member and, you know, that he was doing something wrong. Um, the, the white police officer is, um, held up as a glowing example for the community, all the good things that he's done. And, and yet at the same time, Star knows she was in the car and saw the officer shoot her friend with no provocation. So, Again, I know some of you have probably read this already. If you haven't, I can't really recommend it enough. Um, it's such a, a story of growth for Star, realizing what's important in the world, what's important to her, um, how, how important her own history is to her. So again, um, I really recommend this. Um, a lot of times the movies, movies tend not to be as good as the book, and I would have to agree in this case. So if you're only going to do one, I would definitely recommend reading the book. Again, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. The next book is completely different. Um, it's called The Mall by Megan McCaffrey. Um, I've liked Megan McCaffrey for a long time. She, um, I feel like she's a very lighthearted, funny writer. Um, this is just a breath of fresh air. It's fun. It's light. It's the perfect end of summer read. Um, it would be the perfect beginning of summer read. So if you're going to hold off, you might want to wait till next summer to read this. Um, it's the story of Cassie. Um, it's 1990. She spent the last couple months of her senior year of high school recovering from mono. Um, so she hasn't been to school. She hasn't been able to work. She's just finally recovered and um, she's going to like the first day of her summer job that she and her boyfriend had picked out because they have a plan. They know they're going to college together and they're both going to Columbia and he's going to study one thing, she's going to study the other. They are the, the power couple of their high school um, in New Jersey. And um, so she walks into the mall on the first day, ready to go to her job at the American Cookie Company. And she's kind of blindsided when she finds out that in the past several weeks as she's been ill, her boyfriend has moved on. He's no longer on board with their plan and he has a new girlfriend and um, he's basically dumps her in the middle of the mall. So she now no longer has a summer job. She no longer has a boyfriend. She no longer has this plan that has been the basis for her life for the last several years. And she just kind of doesn't know what to do. She realizes that her parent, well, she thinks that her parents would be disappointed in her if they realized that the plan was coming apart. So she decides she has to get another job at the mall 
to so that they don't even know that her boyfriend broke up with her. Um, she ends up getting a job in a um, clothing store at the mall that is owned by um, an old friend of hers, mother. Um, she and the friend, Drea, they, uh, their friendship broke up years and years ago, and Cassie doesn't even really know why. It just sort of ended all of a sudden. Um, but she comes to realize that Drea, despite the way that she appears and things that she says sometimes, Drea also wants to get out of the small New Jersey town where they live and go to college um, in New York City. She wants to be a fashion designer. Um, to do so, however, she she doesn't have the money. So there's this urban legend at the mall where they both work um, that um, there's money hidden in one of the stores of the mall, and it's like left over from like the early 80s. It has something to do with Cabbage Patch dolls and, you know, hidden compartments. And it's it's a really goofy sort of mystery, but it's fun at the same time. And it's it's also kind of gratifying to see these two friends sort of like repair their friendship from years past. Um, again, I really enjoy this. It's fun. It has some laugh out loud moments. Um, Megan McCafferty has written several other books that I also recommend. Give this a try. It's it's easy to get through and pretty fun. Um, the next book on my list here is The Fell of Dark by Kayla Brorig. Um, I, I listened to the audiobook on this one as well, and it really it has, again, other laugh out loud moments. Um, that being said, I do want to say that there's some language in this book, so if that's something that offends you, you might want to skip this title. Um, it's kind of a weird mix of like a very serious um, vampire story and again, the, the humor and um, drama of uh, a kid growing up. So the main character, his name is Augie. He's failing algebra for the second time. Um, he desperately, desperately wants to leave the small town in Chicago, or excuse me, the small town outside of Chicago where he lives. Um, and he's also never kissed a boy, even though he's 16 years old. And he feels like this is, he's, he's like running out of time in some way. Um, the other thing that you have to know about The Fell of Dark is, as you can probably guess from the uh, vampire teeth here, um, his, the town where he lives is infested with vampires. So he's got that to worry about as well. Um, there's, um, he's pretty much just like going along with his life, taking his art classes, um, having sessions with his tutor for algebra, um, and trying to avoid vampires. And one night he is leaving school after art class and um, he's approached by Jude, who is a handsome 400 year old vampire who is suddenly is telling him that Augie is part of this um, prophecy that might lead to the end of the world and he's the only one that can stop it. Um, he, Augie's pretty dubious about this. Um, but things start piling up that kind of make him start believing a little bit more. Um, for one thing, his tutor, Daphne, um, turns out to be part of this knighthood that is designed, has been around since the Middle Ages to rid the world of vampires. Um, and even the guy, the cute guy at the um, cafe where he and his friends hang out turns out to be a vampire too. So there's a lot. Augie suddenly goes from a fairly regular life to having really the weight of the world on his shoulders. Um, like I said, there's, it's a ser it's kind of a serious story. If you believe in vampires and prophecy, if you buy into the, the main plots of the story, but there's also, like I said, laugh out loud moments, um, with the dialogue. It's really well done. Um, but like I said, there is some language in this book. So if that's not something that you're into, I would give this one a skip. Otherwise, check out The Life of Do the, the Fell of Dark by Caleb Rorig. The last book that I have for you today is actually from the adult section, and it's a graphic novel series. This is just the first one in the series. It's um, DC Comics Bombshells. 
the reason that I really like this series is um, the the graphics in it. Um, it's um, kind of done along like a pinup style from the 40s or 50s. The main characters are all women. So it's Wonder Woman, it's Batwoman, it's Catwoman, it's um, Mira, it's um, Zantana, it's Lois Lane. Some characters that you never really see except in like very supporting roles in other comic books or graphic novels. Um, like I said, this whole series, and it's a complicated storyline, so I'm not even going to begin to tell you, but um, the art in these and um, the fact that all the characters are women, um, heroes, and people that you wouldn't necessarily consider superheroes from the DC universe make this, I think, really special. Like I said, this is actually up in the adult um, graphic novel department, um, but just as if you would put a hold on anything else, we can have this um, available for you at curbside. So check this one out if you are into that as well. And that is actually all I have for you today. Um, thank you again for listening. Um, I'll be back in a couple weeks doing another one of these. And um, like I said, the um, link will be attached if you're interested in any of the titles and want to put them on hold to pick up. And I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.